everybody settle down settle down i mean you did not expect the colts to win nine straight games to end the season did you did you i mean if you did listen more power to you even i one of the most positive colts fans you're ever going to meet in your entire life not have it in me to be that positive i mean we were bound to lose a game eventually let's be realistic right Let's be adults here. And I all hope is not lost. The Colts, as it stands today and going into week 15, are still in the playoffs. They are the seventh seed. Now, yes, there's a lot of season left to play. We absolutely must, must beat the Pittsburgh Steelers this week. But we are the seventh seed nonetheless as it currently stands. Now, this is a provocative title. Of course, it's done on purpose. And I want to make sure we talk about that first, because it seems like once again, after disappearing for, I don't know, about a month or so, because they had absolutely no ammunition whatsoever, the Fire Gus Bradley squad has come back, and they are back with a vengeance coming out of hiding. Now, am I going to sit here and say that Gus Bradley's defensive scheme doesn't deserve a conversation at all? No, of course not. In fact, I'm saying quite the opposite by titling the video the way it is and coming to you with this discussion to start the episode. But I want to make sure that if we are going to have the discussion, that we have all the facts straight here. So one thing before we do this, I do ask, because you know, particularly if you've been here for a while, that I am in the comments section, maybe even unhealthily so, right? And I'm going to look at your comments. I ask if you share your opinion, that you at least hear me out before you do it in regard to Gus Bradley, because quite frankly, I just... I don't want to have to explain myself twice. So I want to start this off with a question for you and really a rhetorical one. You don't have to answer it. I'm going to answer it. What exactly do you expect Gus Bradley to do in a game like this? Now, we can sit here and whine about this pass rush all we want. The Colts, even after not recording a single sack, Versus the Cincinnati Bengals are tied for third in the NFL in sacks. They are tied for fourth in interceptions. They're tied for sixth in fumble recoveries, and they're amongst the top of the league in strip sacks. Had you ever stopped to just consider when we talk about the Colts and their coverage, if that is your issue, which I believe that's everyone's issue, is that we're playing a soft zone or whatever that is, right? You ever stop to think that perhaps we just don't have the horses to cover? I mean, Jalen Jones, who we love, I think he has overachieved. It would really overachieving would be the understatement of the century. Jalen Jones is a rookie seventh round pick, and he's the better of our two corners because DJ Baker was an undrafted free agent in the 2022 NFL draft. You take into account Isaiah Rogers to start the season, bet the other team's money line. Dallas Flowers, before he tore the Achilles, I thought was looking good on this defense. And then, of course, Juju Brents and his impending return, he was starting to look not just good, but like an absolute stud, like potentially shut down corner in this Gus Bradley system. So when you add up all of those components, how exactly can you be surprised and blame Gus Bradley for the fact that the Colts can't cover worth a lick, particularly against a team that has Jamar Chase and T. Higgins on the outside, let alone You know, Kenny Moore obviously was covering him, but Tyler Boyd on the inside. I mean, if your four-man pass rush has been good enough to be one of the premier pass rushes in football 14 weeks into the season, and you're having a tough time covering against a team that's beating you in the short passing game, the quick passing game, the screen game, why in the hell... Would you take more people out of coverage, which you already are struggling to do, to come in and blitz? Doesn't that to some degree sound like addition by subtraction? I mean, am I missing something here? You're aware that the short passing game and screen passes are designed to beat the blitz, right? You're aware of that? I I mean, you might not be. Now, listen, is is that to say that there are... No adjustments to be made over the course of a game? No, of course not. I mean, clearly, the Bengals found something with those screen passes. The Colts look completely unprepared to cover those. Now, EJ Speed so often is the type of guy 
that comes in and cleans up those plays. But to sit here and make it like you are some sort of defensive guru calling for Gus Bradley's job and suggesting that if he just blitzed more, that all would be fixed, when in actuality, blitzing would have been playing exactly into what the Bengals were doing offensively. I mean, you can just save your breath and say you don't know much about the game of football and call it a day. You don't have to sit here and insult Gus Bradley and call for his job and all those things because if he did blitz and then got burned on that, you would have been coming at him from a different angle the same way. You're just looking for a convenient scapegoat. It's what so many of you like to do. It's it's what I hope to change over here is to create more rational Colts fans, right? Because it's not like the Colts had no pass rush in this game whatsoever. Now, sure, it may be nowhere near what we've been used to, but again, we've been one of the top pass rushes in football. So to not have that on a given day maybe looks bad, but I mean, when they did get the pressure on Jake Browning, he was absolutely sensational. I felt like every time we had any form of pressure on the kid, he stood there strong and made a killer throw over the middle of the field, or at least made a good decision. And realistically, most of the time, it was both a good throw and a good decision. So you got to give credit to him. You got to give credit to Zach Taylor, and you got to give credit to the Bengals as a whole, who is a roster of guys that has been to two straight AFC championship games. Now, sure, of course, Joe Burrow was there, but nonetheless, that is a good team. I mean, even their defense, albeit statistically terrible, coming into the game, uh, not today, but this week, you know, that was considered to be one of the top 10 to 12 units in the league coming into the season. That unit is absolutely loaded with talent, right? Now, I want to give them credit. And, 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 you know, kind of take this away from just bashing the Colts. Now, we don't just absolve the Colts of all of their wrongdoing because that was absolutely a failure by that team from the top down. I mean, nothing in that game went right, basically, from the get-go. It was just one of those games. I mean, from the very first offensive snap, Trey Hendrickson absolutely took this game by storm. Bernard Raymond, who has really been nothing short of awesome for us at left tackle, was getting punked absolutely all day by Trey Hendrickson. I mean, Trey Hendrickson grabbed him by his ankles, flipped him upside down, shook his lunch money out of his pockets. Trey Hendrickson handled that dude. I don't expect that to continue. I think Bernard Raymond has built quite a body of work in his short playing career with us for us to give him the benefit of the doubt moving forward that he's going to play better than that. I mean, even a mere speed bumping into Isaiah McKenzie, a week removed from special teams winning us the game. I mean, Lord, to have stuff like that happen, I mean, sometimes it is just not your day. But even with everything I just mentioned, if Matt Gay is to knock down a 38-yard field goal early in that game and Quentin Nelson doesn't get a bogus holding call, and I never, ever complain about the refs, even after the Browns game, I was the one guy talking about all the things the Colts could have done to avoid that situation entirely. I mean, I of course, the Colts got robbed against the Browns, but they never had to be in that position to begin with, right? I always take that stance. That was a touchdown by Zach Moss. You look at that replay, that was not a hold by Quentin Nelson. So if Matt Gay makes the field goal and the touchdown stands for Zach Moss, even in a day like this, where the Colts played maybe their worst game of the season, that would have been a situation where the Colts were only down seven. It would have been 31 to 24, with about nine minutes left in the fourth quarter. And perhaps after all is said and done, if those things work out for us, we're having an entirely different conversation. So to sit here and call for Gus Bradley's job after this loss, after a four-game winning streak where the defense was playing really damn good for most of the time, and to slander Garner Minshew, I mean, Lord, it's just such a reduction, such a shallow reduction of what just happened in that Bengals game, and it just reeks of overly emotional revisionist history that I suppose really all NFL fan bases take part in from time to time, but I absolutely hate to see our fan base take part in it because ultimately, intimately, you guys are the fans that, that you know I'm invested in, right? But lucky for you, I, the voice of reason, am here to spread truth and rational thought, so we are going to talk about what really lost the Colts that football game because it was not Gus Bradley that did it, and then what the Colts are going to need to do to ensure that moving forward they don't have another showing like that because Lord knows they can't afford it. But before we do that, of course, I have to introduce myself. My name is Justin. This right here is the Ride on the Bench Colts cast. As always, I ask anyone that is here and enjoying the video to shoot it a like. It's going to help me get out to as many Colts fans as humanly possible, of course, 
you can subscribe. We're almost at 1,900. We're shooting for 2,000 before 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, a trillion, right? Subscribe if you want to be a part of the journey, but most importantly, enjoy, engage, right? And, and let's, you know, let's make the Colts community a better place to be. So I want to start by talking about what I thought was really maybe one of the biggest issues in this game, if not the biggest issue, was strictly the fact that you just have to run the ball better, particularly on first down. I mean, how many times in this game did the Colts on first and 10 try to hand that thing off just to get stuffed? I mean, in a game like this, I don't know exactly what it is that you want from Garner Minshew. What exactly is it that you are so mad about? I mean, sure, he's the quarterback, and of course we know the quarterback is the most important position on the field. We know Garner has an opportunity every game to impact the game in a way that not many other guys and can, but I thought really he played solid for, for much of the day. I mean, we've won games where he's played worse than that. He is not there to be a guy that makes these huge comebacks and carries the entire offense. I mean, if you ordered a pizza from, from a Domino's or Pizza Hut and you got the order, would you be upset that it wasn't the tastiest sauce you've ever had in your entire life? No. Because you know what you ordered and you know who you got it from, right? You get my point. Garner did everything we'd expect from him. Nothing more. Certainly nothing less. But he did exactly what he does and he is exactly who he is. And I'm not going to give him a hard time for it because we'd be significantly worse off without him this season. And if you think that's not the case, I think you're being a little bit emotional, right? It's not like he was out there making boneheaded plays all day in this game. He just wasn't Patrick Mahomes. He didn't lead a heroic comeback. Ooh, let's fire Garner Minshew. Let's let, let's bench him for Sam Ellinger. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? That We got to run the ball better. Garner's not meant to run this offense when we're not running the ball. We just got to get it done on that side of things. Number two, we got to establish another consistent weapon in this passing game. Uh, that we know is going to be involved all the time, right? It's nice to see them get Alec Pierce involved, and we already know what Josh Downs can do and what he's done on many occasions this year. But other than Michael Pittman, there is no one in this passing game that you are 100% sure is going to be a key part of it on a week-to-week -week basis. There's no one other than Michael Pittman that defenses look at and say, man, if we don't pay attention to that guy, he is going to kill us all day. The Colts have not established that consistent presence. I mean, someday this week, Will Mallory had five receptions. We saw a stretch where Josh Downs was doing it. Kylan Granson comes up. Listen, you can get it from a bunch of different places, but that's got to change in terms of the other team has to know who it is because you got to keep them guessing and you have to give them one more player specifically to worry about on a week-to-week -week basis because something like that can cause a chain reaction that opens up the entire offense. And if it were me, if you were asking my opinion as to who that would be, I think it's got to be Josh Downs, just with how well he and Minshew, just their connection has been from the start of training camp, how well their skill sets naturally work together, with Josh Downs being a chain-moving type of guy, Garner Minshew being a short to intermediate passing game type of quarterback. Their skill sets fit together perfectly well. Three receptions this week, three receptions the week prior against the Titans. That's not going to cut it for Josh Downs. I hope they get back to what they were doing during that, I don't know, month, month and a half stretch. I'm just estimating. I didn't look at it. But we know when Josh Downs was really coming onto the scene and looking like a bona fide star in the making. The Colts got to get back to that because ultimately just having Michael Pittman as great as he is is not going to be enough to keep defenses on their heels, particularly for as long as Jonathan Taylor is out. And then number three, the front four, in Grover Stewart, DeForest Buckner, Quiddy Pay, Dio and Dangbone, whatever rotation of eight guys they want to have in there because you know the Colts have depth at that position, they're going to have to do what they've been doing all season. They're going to have to do what they did not do in this game because, again, the pass rush has been good. It's the only thing that is going to help us in coverage. Taking more guys out of coverage is not going to do us any favors, particularly if we just commit to that all day. Now, would it be nice to see once in a while for us to mix it up? Sure, but to make it like we just have to be aggressive and blitz all day, I assure you guys, with the personnel that we have on defense, that would not work the way you want it to work. So those are the three things, right? Run the ball better, particularly on first down. Establish another consistent threat in this passing game. And then the front four, continue where they left off. If those three things happen moving forward, the Colts are going to be just fine. It should start this week against the Steelers, who I think we should beat. 
This week, I did not predict a win against the Bengals. I didn't predict anything at all. In fact, the big theme in my last episode was we're bound to lose eventually. And in part, not to just sit here and be the Monday morning quarterback, or I guess in this case, the Tuesday morning quarterback, I I was kind of thinking that we might lose to the Bengals. The Steelers, despite a shoddy history against them, I feel like we should win that game. I just have a feeling that the Colts are going to respond well after a game like this. They just seem to respond well to adversity with Shane Steichen in in charge. But again, we're not going to know until we play this game against the Steelers. The good news is I think we match up well. The somewhat bad news is the Steelers are in the same exact position as we are in this game. Whoever loses this game has such a tough road to the playoffs. They both have everything to play for, and we're going to see exactly how that goes. But that right there was the entire episode. Until next time, my name is Justin. This right here was the Ride in the Bench Coltcast. Like, subscribe if you have not yet. But most importantly, go Colts.